Good morning everyone and welcome to Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Northampton for our Palm Sunday service. Really glad that you've chosen to join with us today. And in a special welcome back to the Reverend Mickey Munro, now the senior pastor of Geisley Baptist Church in Yorkshire. But uh, before that was uh, a dearly beloved member of our church congregation, an elder, uh, a minister in training and a much beloved pastor with us. And I'm delighted that Mickey's going to be preaching to us from God's word later this morning. Let's bow our heads, shall we, as we remember the presence of the Lord with us now as we come together to remember uh, the arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem, that first Palm Sunday, and as we prepare to give him our praise and our worship. Let's bow our heads. We read in Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he! humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Blessed are you, O Lord God, God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only son was lifted up that he might draw the whole world to himself. This day, may we walk in the way of the cross and always be ready to share its weight, declaring your love for all the world. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray together. Almighty God, you loved the world so very much that you sent your one and only Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Lord, we confess that we are often quicker to judge than to bless. And this morning again, we fall silent at the extravagance of your grace and the wonder of your redeeming love. And in our world, Lord, where we are so often confronted by the depth of human wickedness, may we understand afresh the greater depth of your divine compassion. And as this week we reflect again on the outstretched arms of Jesus, embracing the world in his love through Calvary's cross, may we confess our part in the sin of the world, repent of it, know the reality of your forgiveness and be transformed and share it with others. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's share together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Hey, Tommy and Eddie here to talk to you about something really great, Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's the Sunday that we paint our palms purple to commemorate King Saul talking to that palm reader lady, and then we wave him in the air. <laughs> no, no it's not. Yes it is. No it's yes, not. Yes it no. is. What Bible do you read? Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now picture this, Jesus rode in on a donkey while the crowds put their cloaks and palm branches all over the ground shouting Hosanna to the son of David. That's what I said. That's what I meant. Okay, now picture this. Jesus' popularity was going viral. I mean, he just raised Lazarus from the dead in the same community just a few days earlier. Wait, post-dead Lazarus was maybe at the very first Palm Sunday? Yeah, probably. That's so cool. I bet if he was there, he was probably like, And you're a thriller, thriller, Jesus. You raised me from the dead when you said, Get up, get up, get up, ooh! Now, to complete all of this, Jesus needed a donkey. Now, you'd think that a king or a prince would ride in on a horse, but not Jesus. He knew the message that he wanted to send. You see, a donkey represents peace. Anybody riding a donkey represented peaceful intentions. Yeah, it says right here in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get him a donkey. Yeah. Hey, I wonder which two he sent. Mm, maybe Thomas. I doubt it. I bet he sent Andrew. Andrew would totally do that, and probably... Tony. I bet he said Andrew and Tony. Tony's not a disciple. Oh, sorry. Tony is. Still not a disciple. What translation of the Bible do you read? Jesus needed a donkey, so he asked two disciples to go get him a donkey. He told them they would find one in town, tied there next to a colt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, untie them and bring them to me. And if somebody asks you about it, you tell them the Lord needs them? Jeez. Yeah. What? Well, Jesus just told his disciples to go steal a donkey for him. What Bible do you read? It doesn't say that at all. I can't figure this out. I mean, Jesus, he changed water into wine. Cool. He fed the 4,000. He fed right? the 5,000. What? He fed the 5,000. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Not the fourth. It's the 5,000. We're splitting hairs. I'm sorry. Jesus fed a large group of people. and That's cool. He, he healed people with leprosy. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and then boom, he's like, hey guys, go steal me a donkey. I'm just saying, I don't think that's very WWJD. The significance of Jesus riding on a donkey, which he did not steal, was to fulfill the prophecy that is found in Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, but the... And the king riding in on a lowly donkey with his way paved with palm branches. The palm branches symbolize triumph or victory. The what? The palm branches. The bread. Palm thought... branches, palm Sunday. The... I thought it was the palm. They should call it Branch Sunday because that's confusing. We all have palms with us all the time. I just, I feel bad. I, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. So this week, let's cover the road to the cross with our hearts, our souls, and our minds as we reflect on the final week of Jesus' life. And let's celebrate in anticipation the return of the King of Kings. Today's Bible reading comes from Mark 11, 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage of Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, 
he went out to Bethany with the twelve.
Good morning, Mount Pleasant, and it's a real pleasure to be with you on this Palm Sunday. Now, if you lived in Israel during the first century, there is a good chance that around this time of year you would have been travelling to Jerusalem to celebrate the, the biggest festival of the Jewish calendar. And if you arrived at the gates of Jerusalem and you saw the scene that we heard read from Mark chapter 11, then you would know exactly what was happening. You probably remember the famous story that was told from 1 Kings 1 when David put his son Solomon on a donkey and one of uh, David's other sons was claiming to be king but David's act made it clear that Solomon was his choice to be the real king. And you might also think about the, the current king during the time of Mark. He called himself Caesar. And you might think about this man on a donkey. That he, he was making a, a bold and, and a dangerous claim to be a, a new king. And you'd see the people yelling and you'd know that these people were really looking for a regime change, that they wanted things to be different. And you would know that they thought that this man could do that for them. So you'd know a lot was, that was going on here, but I, I suspect there'd be a question growing in your mind. And perhaps as you got closer to the scene, it would loom larger and larger. And without knowing the answer to that question, I think you might feel uh, nervous about the events that we're witnessing. You perhaps wouldn't know whether to feel excited or, or pessimistic or, 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 or hesitant or maybe even terrified you would know that, um, that a proclamation was being made about a new kingdom. But I think the question that you'd need to figure out, and it's a simple one, is this. What kind of a kingdom is this man offering? You see, kings aren't just there for themselves. They have kingdoms, they establish them, they rule them, they, they serve them, and sometimes they even fail them. So this morning, as we begin this, this week that leads up to Easter, I want us to think about kingdoms. Uh, you see, the traditional Palm Sunday story from the Gospel of Mark describes Jesus entering into Jerusalem. Uh, and Mark's version of the story has a unique phrase that the other Gospels don't use. And he describes the people proclaiming, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. It's verse 10. So, uh, looking back on this scene with our 21st century eyes, I'm sure we have questions too. So this morning I want to help us with, with phrasing three questions for us to think about, um, asking them of the people in the story and then asking them of ourselves as well. So first, what kind of a kingdom uh, did these people live in during the first century? What characterised their life? And then what about us? What are the, the kingdoms that we live in? You could say, what are the forces that kind of set the tone for our lives? And it might help to think about what a kingdom is. So kingdoms have a leader, someone who governs them. Kingdoms have territory that define them. Kingdoms have, have citizens, the people who inhabit them. Kingdoms have a culture, uh, the kind of life that is lived in this kingdom. In the first century... Uh, Caesar was lured, but there were many other leaders who would have influenced your life. Herod Antipas in Galilee, the, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem, and then you would have had your Jewish scribes and the elders and the high priest. Uh, and life was hard. Uh, most people were poor. Uh, they lived in a small village uh, uh, as a farmer or a shepherd, and, or they lived in a crowded city as a merchant or a, or a tradesperson. Most people had some sort of a group that they identified with. You'd be part of a religious faction or a political alliance or a trade guild or a tribe. So this is the world that they lived in. And it was a, you could say it was a, it was a confusing mix of religious, political, professional kingdoms. But there was one thing, one thing that every faithful Jew agreed with, that this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. After all, this was supposed to be a Jewish nation, not a Roman province. So what about now, some 2,000 years later? Have things changed that much at all? No. Think about the different aspects of your life. What kind of a kingdom do you live in? 
See, the truth is that our lives are also a complicated mixture of allegiances and affiliations and, and memberships and loyalties. Yeah, I know Northampton very well, and I, and I suspect many of you were born locally, but some of you will have backgrounds uh, you know, from Asia or Africa or, or Europe or even Wales. You still consider yourself part of these kingdoms in some sense, particularly when there's a rugby match. But anyway, you work in a in a kind of professional kingdom too. You know, your companies have leaders and territories and citizens and a culture of their own. You're fighting to compete with other kingdoms, trying to take territories and grow your citizens and earn glory for your leaders. You live out your lives in a similar confusing mix of kingdoms political and corporate and social and religious but here's the difference see i think most of us like our kingdoms see for the large part we've chosen them in fact i think we're tempted to think that if we can just manage to find ourselves in the right kingdoms things will work out well for us see our problem isn't that we're dissatisfied with the kingdoms of the world it's just that we think we've maybe chosen properly, uh, poorly. Sorry, we didn't. You know, we didn't get the right opportunity to choose the right company, to uh, to to choose a different community, to to get a better school. And I think one of the greatest problems in our in our areas that we're, that we're and we're not at all exempt from this is that we have too much faith in the kingdoms of the world. You get that? We have too much faith in the kingdoms of the world. And it, seem, it seems to be working out well for many people, except we're still unhappy. The people around us still aren't happy. We complain a lot. We want and we crave and we lust and we demand. So maybe the kingdoms around us aren't all that we think they are. And maybe that's why we want something more. So we move on, our second. So what would make things better? What kind of kingdom do we want? See, that crowd in first century knew that they wanted something else. They knew they weren't happy. And as Jesus walked into the city, they proclaimed Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, it just simply means save now. So you say these people wanted saving. They wanted salvation. In fact, they were, they were, they were longing for a different kind of a kingdom. You could say they were, actually, you could say, they wanted the, the, the glory days of David to return. And they had good, good reason to want this too, because for hundreds of years, the, the prophets had said that this is what would happen. Their lives were kind of saturated with the, the promise of a Messiah. You know, it had, it had been a thousand years since David was king. David made Israel a world power. People feared and admired the nation of Israel. The kingdom of David was characterized by peace and prosperity and prestige. They defeated their enemies. They lived lives of abundance. But, but now none of these things were true in the first century. They didn't know peace. Armed soldiers occupied the land. They, they didn't enjoy prosperity. See, making enough to live on was hard enough before Rome pillaged the, your earnings. And they, they, they definitely didn't have prestige. Israel was a laughing stock. Her God was seen as old-fashioned and impotent. But in the scriptures, faith is always propelled forward by hope, never by nostalgia and certainly not by fear. And when the scriptures speak of the throne of David, they speak of a new king who would redeem his throne, not simply return it to the past. They wanted what they remembered of David's kingdom, peace, prosperity and prestige. And in a word, they wanted a kingdom of success. Are we any different? You know, isn't that basically what we all want? Now, what about you? What kind of a kingdom do you want? And I think... You know, that we want the same things that they wanted in first century uh, peace and prosperity and prestige and i think the odd thing is though and despite the the, the, the notable roadblock which we've all experienced in the last 12 months is that um that we have more of those things than any culture in any period of history has ever known i mean few cultures in history have known the kind of peace which exists in the uk 
And okay, you may not feel prosperous at the moment. And I know the reality of life for many in our in our nation is tough, economically really tough and just uncertain. I get that. But a bit of a bit of context. I have a really good friend who currently works in a part of the world that has been ravaged by a contemporary war, which means the infrastructure of that country have disappeared, which means inflation grows just unbelievably higher and higher each day which it practically means what you pay for a tin of beans on a wednesday can be quadrupled by friday and the result of that is poverty we we live in a land where what we pay for a tin of beans on wednesday is generally what we pay on friday so what do we really want what do we really want we have peace and prosperity and, and i suspect because of that we have prestige what more do we want? You know, I think it's a surprisingly difficult question to answer, isn't it? What I, I suspect many of us don't really know what we want. And see, the problem is when you don't know what you want, you can be bombarded by our culture, bombarded by the messages of our culture who will say to you, what you want is what we're selling. And that all boils down to one word, more. You know, we think we want more money, we think we want more position, we want to be more attractive, we want, to, we want to be more fit, we want to be better thought of, we want to have more free time, we want to be more influential. We already live in a kingdom of success, we have a lot, but we want more. You know, in the first century, you could say that people lived in a, in a failed kingdom and they wanted success. And today we live in a successful kingdom but we still want a different kind of kingdom. We want a kingdom of more. So finally, let me, the, the important question is this, what kind of a kingdom was Jesus actually announcing? And that's just as important for first century Palestine as it is for 21st century UK. And see the spoiler alert here is that it's, it's not what they expected. And it's not what anyone expected. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies concerning his birth and ministry. Even so, the kind of kingdom that he was offering took everyone by surprise. The Gospel of Mark, Jesus began his ministry by talking about the kingdom of God. And in fact, the first words he spoke about in the Gospel had to do with kingdom. So what is the, the kingdom of God? Well, you could say this really quickly. You could say the leader is Jesus. The territory is the whole earth. The citizens are all tribes and all nations. The culture is overflowing. It's abundant. It's eternal life. Now, but there's more than that because you see, those are the specifications. You know, but what's it really like? Now, for example, you could tell me about the engine and the tyres and the upholstery of a car. But what I really want to know is what it feels like to drive it. And that's why Jesus told stories. You know, 17 times in Mark's Gospel, Jesus uses analogies and, and images to, to, to kind of paint a picture to describe his kingdom. Uh, just, a, just a snapshot, we haven't got time. But the, the kingdom must uh, be united or it cannot stand. The secrets of the kingdom are given to those of faith. The kingdom is like a mustard seed which starts off tiny but then becomes massive. The kingdom belongs to children. And there are many more. Try it. Open up Mark's Gospel. I highlight in your Bible if you're into writing in your Bible, and just look at the way that Jesus paints the picture of kingdom. It's a great exercise to do. But you get a flavour. You can get a sense of what it's like. No, we can't always understand it or describe it, but we're drawn to it, don't you think? There is something, something compelling about it. So, what kind of kingdom do you live in? What kingdom do you want to live in? Are you willing to take a step and live in the kingdom that Jesus is establishing? Not to study, but to join. Are you willing to enter? Will you join the kingdom of Jesus? You see, one of the essential aspects of any kingdom is they want to grow. Kingdoms want to expand, to encompass more territory, to count more citizens. Uh, the word that we usually use to describe this is to conquer Kingdoms want to conquer other kingdoms. But the kingdom of Jesus, the, the kingdom that Jesus brings, is no different in that regard. Uh, this kingdom will go. In fact, the Bible declares that the kingdom of God will be eventually the last one standing. 
that. But there is something that makes the kingdom of God different from any other kingdom of the world. I, I, I think you know. You know, the kingdom of the world conquer through violence. I think we've experienced that. Through competition through destruction, through fear. They seek their own glory and they trample any in their way. But not the kingdom of Jesus. Instead of peace, Jesus offered, Jesus, sorry, Jesus suffered violence. And instead of prosperity, well, Jesus is poor. Instead of prestige, Jesus, Jesus is humiliated and publicly scorned. That's the kind of leader who will rule this new kingdom. And this is the, the, the culture for its citizens. Will you join this kingdom? We don't just, you know, we don't just join the kingdom of God. We are agents of the kingdom. We are participants in the love and the sacrifice and the, and the, the, the humility that characterizes and expands this kingdom. Jesus doesn't conquer and neither do we. We don't win arguments and dominate the political scene and protect the power of the church. No, we sacrifice ourselves for the vulnerable. We lay down our lives. We humble ourselves. And this is what it means to love the world. This is what it means to participate in the kingdom of God. It's a new kind of a kingdom that Jesus is bringing. That, that he, you know, that I think it's what we really want. It's hard to describe. It doesn't make sense to everyone, but once you've tasted it, you understand. A leader lays down his life for you. A, a community who embraces you, includes you and sacrifices for you. A life of freedom and meaning and love. This is the kingdom of God. It's the, king, it's the kingdom that Jesus, as he rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, is announcing. It's the kingdom we can join. It's the kingdom that we can, in fact, invite others into. So will you join Jesus in his kingdom? Join him as he proclaims to the world. Amen.
like us to pray this morning for Burkina Faso in uh, West Africa and for Myanmar or Burma uh, in Asia. Let's pray for the, the two countries. Lord God, we just bring um, Burma before you today. Lord, the situation there is appalling. We see people being killed. We see children being killed in what it seems to be a protest. Lord God, we just pray that the um, army that are, uh, ta have taken over the country would relent and that they would bring about a de democratic process quickly. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, particularly those who have lost children in the violence. We just pray that you would comfort them, be with them in that really difficult time. Lord God, we pray that you would help those who are protesting to protest in a way that is uh, helpful and meaningful and brings peace to that country, Lord God. Lord, I just pray that you would bring peacemakers to that part of the world, that they would be able to um, stop what's going on and show your love and, show, and that your love would come and bring peace and calm to that place. Lord God, just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, we pray for Burkina Faso as well. We pray that you would be with the leaders in that country, give them the wisdom they need to help the country to develop in the right ways. Lord, we pray for those working for uh, um, women's rights, and particularly those that are working to make sure that the outlaw on uh, female genital mutilation are um, able to do what they want to. And Lord, we pray that um, as they've uh, succeeded in getting to, into the African nation, a cup of nations, that you would um, make that a really positive thing for this nation and build them up through it, Lord. Lord, we thank you for that country. We just pray for um, peace between the different religions there and that you would uh, be in that place and be helping the Christians that live there. Lord God, we thank you and praise you for um, Christians working in difficult circumstances and especially for those in, um, in West Africa today. Lord Jesus, we pray this in, in your name. Amen.
So let's close our service with prayer. So, Lord God, as we reflect upon Jesus coming into Jerusalem to bear our sins and to conquer the powers of death and hell, may we meet him afresh, share with him in the new life and new ways of the loving kingdom of heaven and be set free to serve him with joy and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you today.